All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robin from MQ Trader and the host for tonight's event. So welcome to our MQ Traders webinar tonight, where we have invited the famous finance YouTuber to share with us about the market outlook in Malaysia and also answer some questions you may have about them and the financial market. So before we start, can we just have a quick mic test with everyone? So if my voice is loud and clear, can you please type one in the chat box to let me know? So please type one in the chat box if you can hear my voice clearly. All right, so a brief info about MQ Trader. Our full name is Malaysia's Quantitative Trader Group. We are a group of traders that collect quantitative data, which is normally only available to large financial institutions only. Then by using this data, we have developed our own MQ Trader stock analysis tool. Then we also made it available to our MQ members for free, as our goal is to empower our traders to make quicker decisions with greater confidence during their stock trading journey. So other than the MQ Trader Stock Analysis tool, we also have all kinds of services like MQ E-Trade, MQ Points Accumulation, MQ Affiliate Program, and many more. Now, if you want to enjoy free access to all these MQ Trader systems for free, you can do so by opening a trading account through our selected advertisers. You can open a trading account if you by scanning the QR code on the screen or type 5 in the comment box if you are interested. So like the MQ Trade tool that I mentioned just now, in this system, you can view a lot of information on each stock at a glance. Now, information includes like live market codes, our own exclusive MQ trading signals, and up to 10 market depths as well. So basically, it's a very great tool if you want to enhance your trading journey. And this one is our MQ Trader Stock Analysis tool. So in this tool, you can get buy and sell signals with just one simple click. Then you can also do automated back tests to test whether this buy signal has a high, high success rate in the past. So for our current MQ members, if you want to use these systems for free, you can visit the link on the screen or by using the links in the chat box. So once again, if you are interested in any of our services and want to use it for free, you can get it now by opening a trading account through our selected advertisers. So you can do so by type 5 in the comment box if you're interested and the team will contact you respectively. So for our MQ members, as usual, you can get a bonus of 300 MQ points as a check-in reward for the night. So to get this check-in point, you just need to take a screenshot of any part of this webinar and then upload the, the screenshot in the quiz email that will be sent to email afterwards. So right here, I'll give you a few seconds if you want to take a screenshot now.
Okay, and we will be having a Q&A session later. So please feel free to send us your questions throughout the sharing. And right after the Q&A, before the webinar ends, we will also have our mysterious gift session where we will be giving out gifts worth up to 249 ringgit. So make sure you stay until the end to win our mysterious gifts. So coming back to our topic today, we have MJ, founder of Fireal, with us tonight. And their full name is Finance in Real Life. They are popular for creating educational content that helps people to learn about the power of stock investing. Now, they have over 40,000 followers on all social media platforms and have accumulated 1.5 million views on YouTube. And MJ will be sharing an in-depth analysis on stocks that offer steady returns in the Malaysian market. And MJ and John will be sharing everything you need to know about a multi-bagger company, including the criteria for a multi-bagger company and the skills and strategies if you want to look for one. So if you guys are ready to know more about MJ sharing today, can you type ready in the chat box to let us know? Type ready if you guys are ready to learn about multi-bagger companies. All right, so since everyone's ready, I will pass the webinar back to you, MJ. Hello, thanks, thanks. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, MQ Trader for giving me this opportunity. I rarely do, you know, uh, public uh, speaking, let's say, uh, but I found that the team at MQ Traders were, you know, very good in their approach, and I think that they're on the right track. So yeah, thank you for that. Now, I want to check whether my mic is good. So if my mic is good, please type a two in the chat, everybody. Just type a two in the chat. Wow, 22. Okay. All right, guys. So um, allow me to share my screen. Okay. So everyone should be able to see the screen. We have, uh, you know, closing up to 100 people. That's very nice. Now, I think, uh, you know, time is of the essence, so I'm going to go straight into it, okay? Now, I just want to start by saying that now this is financial advice. I think if you watch our videos, you know that it's not something that we do. Uh, we like to tell people how we do it. And, you know, if you draw inspiration from it, you know, all the best. Uh, you know, as I always say, uh, if you lose money, don't blame us. If you make money or so, we will not claim credit. Maybe just one Starbucks uh, coffee will do, Okay. So uh, as already mentioned, these are some of the key takeaways. So right? they're going to be four big things that you get that you're going to get away from this uh, webinar. All right, I mentioned earlier on already. So the first one is really what is a bagger. Uh, I always assume that people know what it means, but it turns out that a, a lot of people don't know. So a bagger, quite simply, is how many times, right? So let's say if I call something a ten bagger, it means I made ten times of my money on the investments. This can be used for any asset class, any investments, but it's more popular in the stock investing world. So if someone says I made a 10 bagger on so and so stock, it means that I made 10 times money. I put in 1000 ringgit, I made 10,000 ringgit. Now, this is typically only for investors uh, rather than traders. Uh, typically, a trader, you know, they go in into a position, you know, 10 to 30 percent gains is also is really fantastic. Whereas investors have a longer term uh, framework. So uh, if you're someone looking for those kind of quick gains, how to make 10 baggers in, uh, let's say, three months, uh, this is not the webinar for you. But if, let's say, you want to think, okay, how can I make 10 baggers in a longer time frame, you know, at least three years, three to five years, then this one might be, uh, you know, something that suits you a little bit more. So also as a disclaimer, right, we do own one of the stocks. We're going to cover, as mentioned earlier on, uh, six stocks, right? Six stocks, seven criteria. Six out of the six stocks, we still own one of them. We've owned some of them, the six stocks in the past before, but right now we only own one company. So we just want to make that, you know, put that disclaimer out there. So we are going to talk about the seven key criteria of these six companies. And essentially how we think about things is, you know, it's no different from if you want to find out who has the best ability to do push-ups, right? Uh, or how to be better at push-ups. Right? What you do is you go and find the people with the best ability to do push-ups. Uh, don't just find one. You find, at, you know, at least three, at least five. 
And you ask them what are their habits, right? Uh, maybe they, they do push-ups two, two, three times a day, 100 times each time. Uh, you know, different people have different ways of achieving, you know, a very good push-up status. But if you go through a few, then what you're able to find is this thing called commonalities, right? Each person's body, each person's circumstance, person's circumstances is a little bit different. However, there's always something that is similar. And I think the same can be said for investments, right? So what we want to do is we want to look at Malay. We don't want to ignore all the opinions, all the experience of other people, uh, biases and all that. We just want to look at the facts and we want to say, okay, which are all these successful companies and why have they been successful over the past, call it 10, 15, 20 years. And the six companies are QR Resources, Yinsen, which is in oil and gas, Press Metal, SKP Resources, Time.com, and MyEG. Some of you all may know all of this. I'm quite sure everyone here at least know one of these. So uh, these are the companies we're going to feature. So how long did it take for these companies to do a uh, 10 bagger, right? QR Resources took 10 years. Um, Yinsen actually took, uh, you know, three years. Uh, Press Metal, nine and a half. SKP almost six years, time talk on 12 years, and my EG uh, seven years. Now, all of this is up to 2021 only. I have not updated for 2022 and 2023. And the second thing is that all of this, I believe, excludes uh, dividends. So if you add dividends, it's, it's going to be a lot better. Now, as far as how far they've actually grown, uh, if you look at QR resources, uh, that has been fantastic. 62 times, Yinsen. Uh, 29, Press Metal is the best, SKP, Timecom, IG, you know, so on and so forth. So what is the first uh, criteria? Now, the first criteria is that it must have a small market capitalization. Okay. For those who are not aware, basically market capitalization is how much you can buy the entire company for, right? Or the market value of the company. So the way we come about this is not just by looking at the share price. You know, you cannot say the share price is 20, if it's 20 ringgit means it's expensive, 20 cent means it's cheap. Uh, market cap or market capitalization is really price per share multiplied by the number of shares. So if you have 100 shares, if each share is worth $1, the market capitalization is $100, meaning the entire company, you can buy it for $100. So you want it to have a small market capitalization. Now, the question is, why is it you want it to be small? And the reason is very simple, right? It's easier to grow a company right, that is maybe making sales of 600 million, 60 million to 600 million ringgit versus 6 billion to 60 billion. If you look at, if you think about the maths, right, it's pretty much the same, right? 60 to become 600 is 10, 6 to become 60 is also 10. But going from 60 to 600 is a lot easier. Smaller companies, they're more nimble. Uh, typically, they're a lot tighter. They're a bit more efficient, and that's why they can do it. Similarly, in terms of market capitalization, right? That's not we're talking about business performance. But if you talk about market capitalization, the amount of money required to go into the company to push the price up, from 60 to 600, right? It only requires a little bit of money. So, which means it's going to be a lot easier for it to move up. But to go, to push something up from six to 60 billion is going to be a lot more challenging. To give you a case, right? If a company is so small at 60 million ringgit, for it to grow at 600 million, all it needs is maybe one or two very high net worth individuals to go in. And then suddenly, maybe some of the smaller investment banks can start accumulating position before it starts to grow. But one or two wealthy individuals can't push the price up that much or that effectively with 6 billion ringgit company, let alone push it to 60 billion. For that to happen, you need a very big funds to be able to uh, push it up. And uh, you can go back and check historically, most $6 billion companies don't grow to become 60 billion, but there are plenty, a lot more companies that went from 60 to 600. So then you might ask, okay, what is the definition of small? What, 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 what exactly is small? Now, really it depends on who you ask. People will give you different answers. But the, 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 the accepted description or definition is 750 million ringgit. So if a company is trading below 750 million ringgit, it is defined as small or small cap, we call it. 
And that should be your first, you can call it a radar signal, right? When you're screening or searching for companies, uh, this is one threshold, okay? So again, it's not set in stone 750 million. If you want to put it at 800, that works as well. Or if you are even more stringent, you want to put it at 500, that works as well, okay? But this is just a generally accepted definition. The point is, it is it must be small. And I believe nearly 70% of companies fall under this definition. So most of them are small. So looking back at the data, what can we say about these six companies? Without a doubt, all these six companies, before they became 10 beggars, they were under 650 million ringgit. In fact, most of them, oh, sorry, 750 million ringgit. In fact, most of them are less than uh, 200 million ringgit, with the exception of time.com. Everyone else, you know, the highest was the next highest after time.com was Yinsen, 157 million ringgit. So you can see already, right, there's this pattern, there's this commonality. Now, that's just one. What is the next one? The second one is what we call it must have a growing addressable, growing total addressable market. Or sometimes we call it TAM or TAM for short. So what is TAM, right? What is the purpose of this to you as an investor, to you as someone who want to find that multi-bagger? Total addressable market quite simply just tells you, right, for that company in that industry, or that industry more specifically, how far can it grow? What is the runway? How long is it, right? We know that for airplanes to take off, the longer the runway, the better, right? If you have a short runway, it's hard to take off. So the bigger the TAM, the bigger the ability for it to become a multi-bagger. It just tells you the potential. So let me illustrate that. Predominantly, most companies fit into one of three buckets. Maybe they mix sometimes. One is a shrinking total adjustable market. The other is stagnant. And then the last one is growing. Now, of course, you want to be in the growing area. But what does the other two look like? The examples I always give would be Star Newspaper. They have what we call a shrinking total adjustable market, right? If you think about it, nobody is really using newspaper. For me personally, the greatest use of newspaper is to put, uh, you know, in my car seat, uh, where we put the foot area, you know, in case I go hiking, so I don't dirty my cars. Uh, now, that is a shrinking total adjustable market. You want to avoid companies like that. Then the second one is stagnant, right? Stagnant means they're not really growing, but they're also not declining. Uh, typically, they are something like spritzer, right? I mean, everybody needs to drink water, but not that much new human beings are being born that they need to drink water. And it's not like Spritzer is now selling some new type of water uh, that they just entered the market that is going to, you know, boost the energy. That's caffeine, you know, caffeine water. I don't know. They might have started, but uh, certainly uh, I, I don't think I've heard of them. Lah. But, uh, you know, they sell water, right? They say they can serve different bottle looks, you know, recently about a year or so ago. They now change how their bottles look like. Uh, maybe they can put more or less certain chemicals in their water. But by and large, you know, they're here to stay, you know, there's not going to be much change in the company. It's not much, it's not a bad future, but it's not a great future either. So what companies actually suit the growing PEM description? The one company that comes to mind in, of the six, I can't cover all of them, but one company that really comes to mind is MyDG. So if you didn't know, they got listed around 2006, 2007. And they are, of course, famous for doing your road tax uh, payments through digital means as well as foreign worker permits. Now, we're only going to focus on the road tax uh, payment digital uh, as of now, okay? So ba ba back in 2007, Malaysia roughly had 23 million vehicles on, on, on the roads, right? Or rather that people own. So obviously, each of these uh, vehicles need to pay road tax. Typically, a road tax for the digital payments, it charged about... 30, 30 ringgit uh, a year in 2007, not today. And if you do a simple multiplication, right, it means that the amount of money that, you know, would, people would pay every year on road taxes at two, in 2007 was roughly 700 million uh, ringgit. Now, roughly 30% of this goes to MyG. MyG don't, don't take everything, obviously, because they need to pay the government, right? It's a road 
it's a tax. There's a word tax there. But of the 700 million, typically my EG will take uh, 30%. This would imply that the company has a total addressable market of 210 million ringgit. It means on the table for my EG to eat, okay, there's 210 million ringgit. Now, of course, today is a lot higher, right? But I'm just, you know, transporting you back to 2007. Now, this excludes all the sales from their foreign worker, right? Um, or all the other business units, just this alone. Revenue for 2007 for MyG was only 25 million, which is nearly 10 times the revenue, 210 divided by 25. So this is what I mean by total adjustable market, right? So yeah, you know, MyG was considered a growing total adjustable market and a lot of things you could have foreseen that, right? It's not, we are not looking in hindsight and things like that. And if you think this is what we call hindsight bias, looking at the past and reverse, um, was it impossible to find the number of registered vehicles in Malaysia? Was it impossible to find the average road tax payment uh, in Malaysia? Answer is no, right? Even back in 2007, this is something that we could have asked around and, and figure out. And also, do you need to be 100% accurate on the figures? Let's say if it's not 700 million uh, ringgit, but instead it's, I don't know, two, uh, I don't know 500 million ringgit, that's still 150 million ringgit, you know, that MyG could uh, potentially get in revenue, uh, which would still represent a one, two, three, six X, right? So um, you do not have to be precise, right? It's not what we call quantum physics or, you know, building the nuclear bomb. But, you know, you can be, as Malaysian say, la, aga, aga. you don't have to be spe too specific. Okay, third criteria. Uh, trust me, the rest will be a lot faster. Uh, these two and three will be the longest. So what is the third criteria? And the third criteria is more, some of you all have been in the market, probably know this term well. So I will not spend too much time here. But a mode essentially is something that protects the company, right? If you think of a company as a castle, you want a mode to be able to protect the castle, right? Protect from crocodiles, from invading armies and things like that. And of course, in the business world, invading armies and crocodiles and all that, uh, what we call competition. So why is more important? Mode is important because just because a company has a big temp doesn't mean that it's going to be a winner, all right? The classic example is social media. A lot of social media apps out there, people trying to start, we have all heard of MySpace, Friendster in the past, but we know that there's one big winner, which is Facebook, Instagram, right? Of course, now you have TikTok. But not every social media company is going to win. And this is also true for any other industry, right? Uh, whether it's electric vehicles, whether it's renewable energy, solar panels, whatever it is, right? Solar panels is growing, but who is going to be the big winner? That's a lot more difficult to figure out than let's say telco companies, right? So what a mode is, if I can summarize based on what I just told you, is that it will tell you which companies will most probably win. You don't just want there to be a lot of food on the table, which is total adjustable market. But you also want the guy who's able to grab the food the most and the fastest. Now, there are a lot of type of modes out there, but we'll just focus on one today. And let me explain to you what I mean by this in concrete terms, okay? One type of mode is what we call a cost advantage mode. And a cost advantage mode is not simply the person who can charge their products and services the cheapest, okay? Anyone can charge their company the cheapest, but they must charge their, com their products and all that the cheapest and the competitors cannot copy. And that's the key, the competitors cannot copy. I can go out now and sell my coffee in a kopitiam for 50 cents. I'll have a lot of people buying my coffee at 50 cents because you know, who is doing it at that price, but I'll go out of business very, very quickly, right? So what exactly does it look like? Uh, which company am I referring to? And that example is uh, Timecom. Timecom is a classic example. So uh, this one I just uh, took from today, okay? If you look on your left, Timecom, 500 megabytes per second is 139 ringgit, okay? versus our good friend Telecom Malaysia, which is nearly double that. You know, it's actually, it's actually double, 
right, at 278, 279 ringgit per month. For the same thing, Mr. Timecom can actually give you half price. Now, of course, DM will try to bundle it with, you know, Netflix and all this other stuff. Um, but I think those are things that very few people really care about, right? People just want to look at the price. So why is it that Timecom can charge at that price and TM don't do it? Why can't TM say, okay, I'm going to charge 129 ringgit per month for 500 Mbps? And in a picture, this is the reason. You see, the difference between Timecom and TM is that TM must go to the Kampong Ulu area to service. Okay, so in order to do that, both companies, regardless of where they service, they need to have a telco line and they need to pull the telco line into the area. And for every kilometer of telco line that they pull, give or take, my last updated numbers is anywhere between 200 to 250,000 ringgit to pull per camp to pull a telco line. Right. I'm not an expert. I could get my numbers uh, not the most accurate, but it's around there. And so, Telecom Malaysia has the objective to want the entire Malaysia to have internet, which means they are forced by their own mandate to go to kampung areas and service them. So what happens when you go to a kampung area? First of all, kampung area is a lot more out there. So the lines that they have to pull is a lot longer. And then when they pull the lines to these areas, people typically are not as, um, they don't use as much internet and also they are maybe not able to afford it as much, okay? They maybe have to go for the cheaper package. But even if you assume they, they go for the typical package, if you pull your line to a kampong, how many people will be using the internet? How many houses are there in a typical kampong? maybe 100, maybe 200, right? Now, in contrast, Time.com does not have to make sure that the whole country has internet, right? Time.com doesn't care. Time.com wants to make profit. So what does Time.com do? Time.com will pull a wire to a nearby condo, a nearby office building. And each office building will have 150, 200 different companies, each condo, maybe 300, 400, 500 different units. And so as a result, what happens is that Timecom is going to be a lot more profitable and so they can afford to charge half the price, even though, and even or despite doing that, they are still at least two times more profitable than Telecom Malaysia if you check the numbers. Unfortunately, I didn't put the numbers here, but you guys can go and check yourself. So you can see how this is a mode, right? This is a special unique advantage that something someone as big as TM can't do. And this is the thing that allows Timecom, in addition to the total, total adjustable market of internet usage, data usage. This is what allows Timecom to win over the long run. Okay. Now, is everyone um, you know, still awake? You know, I just want to check, you know, give me a one if you're still, if you're not, if I'm too far, if I'm at the right speed and you guys are following, give me a one. All right, fantastic. Well, that's 120 of you guys, nice. Okay, so moving on. Fourth, okay, I, I will uh, rest assured four, five, six, seven, be very fast. Number four is owner operated slash skin in the game. So, you know, it's very simple, right? If the owner, owns a lot of the company, a big chunk, he will stand the most to gain by improving the company and also the growth of the share price. So as a minority shareholder, and I assume most of you are attending webinars, typically are minority shareholders, you want to be able to write, you want to be a small it can be list to write on the big shark. Now, of course, not all sharks are fair, right? But almost all companies that have done well have one big shark leading the pack. And that's what we call owner operated. When you let the government take over everything, when you let multiple, when there are multiple shareholders who are equally as powerful, uh, things don't get done, right? So there's no doubt there are a lot of companies out there where it's family owned, 
it's owner operated and they're very stingy. They don't pay dividend and they don't do the right thing with uh, shareholders money. I get it. it. Definitely is there, but it's still the case that you do need an operated owner operated, uh, company for it to do well. That's just how it is. So you can see of the six companies, right? Here resources, Chara family, more than 50%. Yinsen, Lim family, more than 30%. Kuhn brothers, almost 60% for press metal. SKP, Gun family, uh, 47%. Time.com, Afzal, 30% using his Pulau Kapas vehicle. And of course, Mr. Wong Tian Sun with my EG at 32%. So these are very significant uh, amounts. Of course, it, it does not need to be necessarily a majority ownership, but it needs to be significant. Right. Basically, they have to eat their own cooking. Okay, so that's criteria number four. We go to criteria number five. So this is a little bit technical. I will not get into the super technical part of this, but it's a very important ratio that I have and my research team always talk about. And that is ROIC. It's called Return on Invested Capital. So what in the world is this? formula or this criteria and why is it important? To cut long story short, it tells you how efficient the management is at managing and investing capital. So obviously the higher it is, the more efficient the management is. Okay. Now, of course, you cannot just compare across all different companies and say if 10% is uh, company A and 15% is company B, company B is better than company A. Of course, it's always within the context of the industry and things like that, right? But that's really what ROIC tells you. Some of you have heard of this, some of you have not, but let me, uh, you know, piece through this and explain to you for those who are unaware. The beauty of ROIC is that over the long run, and again, here we have an investing time frame, not a trading time frame, right? Returns on investor capital and share price over the long, long run is around the same, right? And in the end, it really highlights how disciplined management is. Companies that sustain a high returns on investor capital tend to be more disciplined. I have had the privilege of meeting many of these management, and I can tell you that their kind of discipline is the, is the best, right? If they bid for a contract, if their opponent simply bid and bid and say, hey, I'll do it for 50% less, They'll say, okay, fine, I'll give it to my competitor because I don't just want to close the sale just so that I can book high revenues, but my profit is rubbish. They will rather forego potentially big contracts if it means that they can maintain their discipline, their financial discipline. So you might be asking, what is high, right? And there's no, again, there's no cast in stone, there's no magic formula that's going to tell you what's high and low, but we can get a good gauge by looking at what decent companies in Malaysia and abroad, how do they grow their capital? What is their return on investor capital? And the answer is for decent companies is eight to 10%, slightly higher than, you know, or actually maybe two times, maybe even three times higher than their GDP. Typically it's like that, right? So the country GDP. So even in Malaysia's case, decent companies can grow at 8 to 10%. Okay. And this is also why the stock market returns over long, long run decades is also around 8 to 10%. But of course, in Malaysia's case, uh, you know, it's a bit lower, right? So what is high? Well, companies that can do that or even more than that, you know, double digit, 15%, and anything above 20% is incredibly, incredibly high, right? Um, so that is really the area that you want to look at. Now, again, going back to the data, right? What does it actually tell us? So I use SKP resources as an example. Um, from 2003 to 2009, they spend more time above the average decent returns on invested capital. But after 2009, when they got their Dyson contract, that's when you see the balloon. That's when you see the huge jump. Now, to be fair, it's lumpy, right? It grows, 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 38%, then suddenly 15%, then suddenly 67%, 26%, 25%, 34 you know. It's not a smooth ride. But overall, if you take pre-Dyson and post-Dyson, post-Dyson on average is going to be higher than pre-Dyson. And what is very interesting, 
is that when you compare the returns on invested capital after Dyson and you compare it with the share price gains every year, it tracks very closely, right? 30% versus 31%. Uh, percent. Now, recently, of course, Dyson have had uh, issues, right? They have issues with, um, you know, the, the labor concerns, the EMS concerns, you know, uh, Andy Hall, these guys. So you can bet the ROIC is going to drop. And of course, we know the share price has already dropped. So it should uh, look quite similar. Now, if you compare with all the others as well, you can actually see this trend. Now, of course, if you look at Timecom and Cure Resources, they do spend sometimes below the decent company average, especially Timecom. Now, they are a unique case because Timecom is a company that has a lot of big assets. I mean, it's a long story. They have a lot of history. Uh, but as a company, imagine they have network infrastructure that they have to build, a uh, line, you know, earth that, that they have to dig up. And so all of this actually adds up to the capital, which means the return investor capital is a bit low. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier on, not all criteria must be met for it to be a good investment. Okay. So this is uh, really, I just compare these four companies. Uh, you can do the, you know, for the other companies as well, if you have free time. Free time. Now, number six is reasonable valuations. Okay. So um, I'll breeze through this. Okay. Uh, you know, some of you have heard of the P ratio. So I'm just going to give a very brief description, right? Imagine if two companies or two coffee shops, right? Both are Kopitiam, but of course one is a cafe, the other one is a Kopitiam. Both selling for 10 million ringgit, right? Um, if the coffee shop is selling for 1 million ringgit, but the Kopitiam is selling for 5 million ringgit, obviously you would prefer the Kopitiam, right? Because one is selling for 10 times PE, the other one is selling for two times PE. So in one, in the first case, it takes 10 years for you to get back your money. And then for the second case, it takes uh, two years for you to get back uh, your money. So this is the basic idea of e ratio la, for those of you who have uh, never, never heard. Okay. So now the question is what is reasonable? This is probably the, the least concrete part of the least concrete criteria, right? I unfortunately cannot give you super specific numbers. But essentially, all else being equal, the lower, the better. You can compare it with the stock market average to give you a sense of what, what is it like. You can compare it to peers. That also gives you a sense, right? Just like this coffee shop and the coffee club. And why this is powerful is because if you look at the blue line, right? The blue line is really the average PE of the KLCI, okay, over the years. And if you can see, if you can draw a line, right, for the, in, you can draw a line in half, let's say 2010, okay? You can see a lot of companies were actually trading below the P ratio of the KLCI, right? The P's were less than 16, less than, you know, 17, 18, roughly there. And of course, if you bought these companies then at these lower valuations, especially compared to the KLCI, what you would, expect to see is actually a lot of growth once all the other criteria have been identified. Okay. So don't just go out there and then just buy a company that is a 12 times PE just because MJ showed you this chart. Okay. But you can see over time, this is what we call multiple expansion, PE expansion actually boosts up the share price. And think of PE ratio as a bit like how popular and how people think about a company. The higher the PE, the more perceived value that people have on their company. And people say, well, this company has a certain quality that I like, right? Mm -hmm. So that's reasonable valuation, and of course, a PE growth, which is what I talked about uh, earlier on, right? If you can buy an awesome company at a reasonable valuation, uh, that's the best, right? So, you know, these are the rough seven criteria. So to give you a okay, study QL resources, right? For all the way leading up to 2010, almost 2011, they were always trading below the KLCI. And then of course, uh, you know, 2015, they appear on the edge. So now people start to take notice of them. So start, people start seeing their quality. And then of course they bought Family Mart, right? In 2016. So suddenly because of these two, uh, or not suddenly, you know, 
starting from 15, 16 onwards, people start to pay attention to them. And then, of course, once 2018 rolls about, where Family Masters opens to show some results, and then suddenly people start to have a lot more positive uh, feelings about the company. And then you can see, right, it goes from 25 times earnings and boom, goes all the way to nearly 52 times earnings. So, you know, business fundamentals pretty much move the same direction, same speed, but then the share price moves faster because people start to identify the quality. And how do you determine the quality? Well, again, total adjustable market, management skin in the game and also the mo right and also small okay so you can see the pe growth for each of these companies right ql uh was 10 grew to 55 yinsen yinsen 21 they didn't really change um press metal 10 to 34 skp doubled from to 18 timecom is the smallest one 15 to 22 times uh my g is around 20 to 31 times okay so to really conclude and bring everything uh, all together, right? All these signs were is something that you can actually figure out, right? Before most of them, not all, to be fair, you can figure out before, and you have enough emotion information before I'm to take action. And this is not insider information, right? The second thing is, not all stars have to line up, right? Just five out of seven criteria is discoverable and good enough, right? Timecom didn't fit the returns or invested criteria. And time con was very close to the um, to breaking past the small market capitalization definition. But the big one that you have to have spend time on is time and modes. The hardest to remain because it takes time for you to read and to understand what I just said. Although I said it in half an hour, actually takes time to figure out, right? And so a lot of work and thinking is required. Huge issue with. Patience and emotional control, I would say this is the biggest challenge, two biggest challenge. Then these companies took 10, you know, years, you know, we even took three, but most companies didn't take three, most companies took more. And so patience is uh, very, very important, right? And, you know, noise, market commentary, and, you know, uh, you know, I will put my head out to say this, but, you know, even uh, sometimes some of these chats on i3, right, can be, can actually prevent you from making the right decision. Although I think IT has been a net positive. Uh, a lot of things have, can, can be discovered through chatting with people on IT, but sometimes it can be to your negative and you need to be aware of this. You cannot remove the negativity, but you have to be aware of this, right? And you know, just one thing I want to add is, you know, don't focus on big, too many big or purely numbers, right? A lot of people just hear, okay, there's a criteria ROIC, now I'm just going to calculate ROIC and invest based on that. Uh, that's not how you do it, right? ROIC is just one of seven criteria. And I think I want to add, you know, you don't actually have to buy it at the right time. So case in point is SKP. Right now, of course, if you bought SKP when they got the Dyson contract, you make 26 times your money. But, you know, most of us are not that good, right? We take time to see things. We take time to figure out, oh, is this Dyson thing, you know, actually going to work out in 2009? Who knows? Now, let's say if you have a wait and see approach and you say, okay, I'm going to wait a few years, then only I see the performance, then only I buy into it. Can you still gain? And the answer is yes, right? If you bought it three years after the Dyson contract, you will still make 11 times your money. Of course, the cutoff point is 2021, right? So don't have this mindset of, oh, I need to catch the right timing or it's all over. Uh, you know, there's still an opportunity. Yeah, I think I said uh, not all criteria need to be met. And, you know, patience, emotional control is the most important. And the second biggest challenge is really research effort. Okay, now I can't help you with patience, but I can help you with research effort. And, oh, actually, sorry, I do have some sight on, on some patients. For those of you all who find patience very difficult, okay. Um, what I like to do is that there's really no need to go all in, right? If you're a person that really, you know, she, 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 you're itchy handed, okay, sure, take a position, but start small. Start small, recognize that there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in every investment. That's why you need to start small. And as certain uncertainty start to clear up, you can slowly add, slowly add, just like you, just like SKP, right? You start and then you build as you gain uh, in confidence. Right? This is very good to help manage your emotions and your risk. 
And of course, uh, you know, there's more to life uh, than investing, right? If you always follow the stock market, I'm quite sure you do not have the best mental health, right? Focus on the important criteria, not, uh, you know, is there uptrend, downtrend, or what's happening during the state elections and things like that, right? You just buy it, buy it over time. And then, uh, you know, if you make the right decision, you know, you can even forget it. Go have some fun, right? It will help you with patience. Focus on the fundamentals, right? Time and mode really important. If you get, if you understand 80% of them, the battle is really won. Really. I would say even 90%. These two are the most important criteria. One, criteria one, four, five, six, and seven is things you can figure out very quickly. So you don't need to spend too much time on that. ROIC, if you know the formula, you can just get in, find out how much shares the company owns, what's the market cap, uh, what's the PE, what's the P growth things. Oh, okay, maybe not the P growth, but you know, by and large, it's very easy to figure out. Tell me more, it takes the most time. Now, ultimately, patience, emotional control is something you have to journey on your own. I, there's only so much I can say for you to take and implement over time. But one thing I can help you with uh, is actually uh, research, okay? So as a rule, I think most investors should learn how to do it themselves. They should be confident. They should be, uh, what's the word? Uh, capable, self-capable, self-reliant to be able to find their own investments. But I also understand that research takes time, right? Typically a company for myself and my team, we take anywhere between 10 to 100 hours to research uh, and beyond. And, you know, if you're busy, you know, maybe you have kids or maybe you do have time, but you're already retired. So you might find it, you know, you just don't have as much energy anymore, especially mental energy to go and research companies. Or maybe you want to travel or maybe you want to meditate and, you know, do stuff that are less taxing. Or maybe you working for long hours. You have two jobs, you know, Malaysian Ringgit is not very good now. So maybe you need two jobs or three jobs, uh, you know, or you have a demanding boss, whatever it is, right? So even if you say, like, I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to do research, but I just can't find the time and I totally get it, right? It's hard, right? Especially you need 10 to 100 hours per company. Um, here is how I can and I would like to help you, okay? So my team, we run this program called Fire Pro and it's designed for busy people, designed, designed for people who want to understand, can understand companies, want to invest, but they have an issue with time and they need to speed up their research. And this program is designed exactly for them. So what can you get if you are part of the Fire Pro network? And I've, before that, I want to thank MQ Trader for allowing us to share this program with you. You can have access to all the course materials, which is worth at least $5,000 US dollars each, right? You have two stock reports per month for a minimum. On average, we've actually done three to four. These reports, and the key is this, these are not long reports that will eat up a lot of your time. Five to 15 minutes, or as I like to say, you know, one coffee, that's all you need, okay? You get a big picture report. So this is uh, more like, uh, you know, macroeconomy stuff once every quarter. Then you also be part of our, you also have access to our Fire Pro, Telegram, uh, Fire Pro portfolio and our old Telegram portfolio now called the Catalyst portfolio. That's number three. Number four, you get what we call management insights or notes. We visit this management of this company to help figure out the total adjustable market, the temp, to find out what the management is like, to find out whether they have good discipline, to find out whether they have a mode or not. We take all our findings, and we synthesize it for you. Number five, research requests. If you guys have any companies that you want us to research, we'll do research for you. And of course, we have, uh, you know, Q&A, which, uh, you know, twice a month, we will actually give you a written response, okay? Then you also get a free digital course worth 247 US dollars that we built totally online. If you, whatever you learn in the course content, if you were to go outside, if you attend a, a course or, a, you know, if you're a seminar guy, it's going to cost you four to five thousand ringgit. We're going to give you something a lot more affordable, but for totally free. It's called Stock Investing Blueprint Program. Uh, you know, we have, you know, a lot of these different uh, course outlined here, right? 12 hours plus of content. Every now and then you add 
uh, you know, new videos for no additional cost. The Fire Pro Network, you get to network with full-time investors, fund managers, analysts, you know, absolutely priceless. I can't really put uh, a, a, a price to this. If you want to find a job, there are people there who can help link you or maybe they themselves are hiring. And if you have any questions, right, on how to improve your investing, how to find out the mode and the total adjustable market and things like that, uh, there'll be tons of people there to help you. We also have, you know, in these discussions, there's a lot of ex-fund managers who actually give us some of these private insights that, you know, typically it's not um, publicly shared. And so they will explain, you know, uh, very, very helpful. And some, some of them have helped a lot of our viewers actually gain uh, as a result. This is our Catalyst portfolio. Uh, so far, it has done uh, this pretty decent. And our Firo Pro portfolio, right, which has also done, you know, we have really one multi-bagger, not all our multi-baggers so far. Uh, we don't get everything right, but we have uh, roughly, I'm going to eyeball 17 companies. You know, so far, two-thirds, give or take, have done uh, pretty decent. So this is something like a reference portfolio, right? If you want to build a portfolio, what does it look like? And of course, research requests. So far, we've researched actually up to 59 companies already. So if you request, we have fulfilled that in the span of a year. And the management notes, the one I talked to you about earlier on with, you know, meeting management in private, getting the notes, getting all these, uh, you know, very special insights about the company. Again, all of this is designed to shortcut your research, right? Instead of you having to read an annual report, instead of you having to text the management yourself or send them an email and hope they respond or ask experts, uh, we actually do it for you. Over the course of the past year, we've had 78 of these notes, six to seven every single month. And in fact, we are probably a bit slacking. So we actually want to increase this, um, you know, closer to maybe nine or 10. So all this really for 5,244 US dollars and countless of other uh, priceless benefits, right? Now, if you were to go on to our website and try and figure out how much this costs, it will be 557 US dollars for a year. Now, the cool thing is because you guys come through NQ Trader, you all will be getting a special discount for a day. So all the way until tomorrow, 11.59, you all will get a special 50% discount for the next here it says here 24 hours, actually it's closer to 26, 27 hours. And instead of 557, only you guys will be able to get for 279 US dollars only per year. And then when you resubscribe the following year, it will be at that, this price. So it's really a once in a lifetime opportunity for you guys. This is, I think, the first time that I've done it in a platform outside of my own. So you guys are really the first to be able to gain access to this very special discount. Now, for those of you all who are interested, you can scan the QR code uh, on your right and, you know, it will send you to the link to sign up. Or uh, if it's possible, uh, we will actually put in the link uh, for you to click on, right? The Bitly link. Okay, guys? So we will put the Bitly link uh, soon, but that's basically how you can do it. All right, guys, so 24 hours, give or take, 50% discount, special for NQ Trader, webinar attenders only. Now, we also accept online banking transfers, right? Let's say if you don't put in your credit card, just email us at hello at fire.co or you can message us on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, sorry, and fa yeah, Facebook and Instagram, sorry. So uh, we already posted the link for you to click the bit link in the chat you can actually uh, click on it, right? So uh, I'll just type out the email. So it's hello at fire.co. You can ask us all your questions there for clarifications, okay? So I'm going back here, give you guys another five seconds to look at the QR code. Okay, so um, now, once you make a purchase on the program, you can actually, within 10 days, if you feel like this doesn't really suit you, within 10 days, you send us an email or contact us in any way, shape or form. Even if you meet me in person, you will say, hey, I don't like your program. Uh, please give me a refund. Uh, we'll give it to you, right? We won't ask any questions except really to ask you why so we can improve on the subscription. 
Um, and yeah, and the key is uh, you exclude SST and payment provider charges, okay? So within 10 days, don't like money back guarantee, okay? So really you have two options, right? Either you do nothing and you do it yourself, which is also something I recommend. I think if you really can do it yourself, go ahead. You have my full support and encouragement. Or if you feel like that doesn't really suit you, but you're afraid of committing the amount of money, you can always give it a try and it's totally risk-free because within 10 days, you can just ask for a refund, okay? Now, guys, I will give back the floor to MQ traders um, for the Q&A. All right. So thank you, MJ. So once again, for those who are interested in signing up for Fibro Pro, remember you can use this code or the link on the screen to sign up today. And for today only, you can get a 50% discount on the package. Now for MQ members, remember that you can get a bonus of 300 MQ points as a check-in reward for tonight's webinar. So all you have to do is screenshot any part of this webinar and then submit it in the quiz email that will be sent to your email afterwards. So right here, I'll give you around a few, few seconds to take a screenshot. Okay, so like we mentioned just now, other than the MQ Trader Stock Analysis tool, we also have our MQ E-Trade, MQ Points Accumulation, MQ Affiliate Program, and many more. So if any of you are interested and want to enjoy free access to all this MQ Trader system, you can do so by opening a trading account through our selected advertisers. So if you want to open a trading account, you can type 5 in the chat box or scan the QR code on the screen to proceed. We'll be having a Q&A session after this, so please feel free to send us your questions. And right after the Q&A session, we also have our mysterious gift, where we'll be giving out gifts worth up to 249 ringgit. So make sure if you want to win our gifts, stay until the end. All right, so we'll be starting our Q&A session now. The first question for MJ is by Eugene Wong 794 The question is, how do you calculate ROIC? Okay, thanks uh, Eugene for the question. Now there's actually, so this is a Googleable answer and there's actually several different types of formulas. Um, so you can Google and you can use the classic one, which is I believe net profit over equity plus debt. I prefer to not use that. I My preferred one is to use net profit or free cash flow. Uh, and what I like to do is I like to use a three or five year average of free cash flow for the company. Uh, I'll adjust for any once off, actually, yeah, maybe I'll adjust for any once off capital expenditures. So I'll have net profit or free cash flow on top, and then it'll be divided by uh, net working capital plus fixed invest fixed assets. So net working capital is just accounts receivable plus inventories minus accounts payable, and then fixed assets will be um, property plan and equipment. So that is, uh, yeah. So I think uh, Jonathan, uh, you know, we already put on the formula earlier on, right? Divided by fixed asset plus working capital. So that's my version, right? Not This is not necessarily the, the more accepted version. All right. The next, the second question is from Victor Liu Jun Xiong. A question he asked is about, have you encountered some stock supposedly doing well, measured by all... Uh, just a moment. But measured by all method, for example, PE, but the shares not in good result. Yeah. Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, you're saying that have you encountered have I encountered a company where the P is low but the share price never moved, right? Um, yeah, at tons of them. And a lot of companies are low PE for a good reason. 
uh, usually the management don't want to give the cash to the shareholders, the minority shareholders. They don't want to grow the business. They just want to stay there and, you know, do nothing with it. So that's why we have seven criteria. The seven criteria is there to tell you that you cannot look at things from a one dimensional perspective. In this case, if you just use PE as the sole criteria, that is far from enough for a share price to even do well, let alone become a multi bagger. Okay, the third question is by TCY1011. It's about what are the potential risks associated based on the strategy? Uh, if I understand your question correctly, you're saying based on the seven criteria, if we use that, what are the risks? So the risk is that you get your research wrong. That's the first one. So you thought that the company has a moat or you thought the total adjustment market is very good, but you got it wrong and that can happen. The second one is that you only take one or two criteria and you ignore the rest. So a good example would be you know, people investing in solar or technology counters just because they have a good total adjustable market, but they forgot they have to look at mode as well. And they have to look at management and things like that. ROIC, whatnot. The third reason why, the third risk is yourself, right? You may get things right. And certainly I've done this myself as well. I found companies that fit those criteria. I'll give you an example, Kobe Engineering, a company in the right time. The mode is so-so. Management had a pretty high stake, good ROIC, good PE, a small market cap. So out of the seven criteria, maybe five was fulfilled. Um, but I didn't take action. All right, because I saw the share price never move. So I thought, well, when is it going to move? So I wasn't patient. So sometimes yourself is the, the risk. These are the three big ones. Okay, so moving on to the fourth question is by Kresla. When Dyson cut ties with ATA IMS, the share price dropped by 90%. How to cover ourselves from this even though we do analysis? So this is the last question for the night. Oh, okay. So the thing is, again, I go back to what I said earlier on, right? What are the risks? You understood the mode, but actually not really. You understood the total adjustable market, but not really. So in this case, if you understood the mode of SKP resources, you will understand that they are very much tied to a single customer, right? And they have a certain kind of mode where it's not a strong mode, but a weak mode. So you can imagine the castle with a mode, but it's narrow. What I mean by that is because they're tied to a single customer, the mode is that they are, the customer will find it hard to switch because they're so used to one customer and they need to have very fast orders, Tyson. So they can't afford to switch and have too many different vendors. But of course, because when you have one, anything can happen and they decide to cut you, they, they cut you. So I'm not saying that if you use this method, you would have known beforehand that after IMS and all these guys would, would, would cut, right? Um, but I'm saying that you would understand that the company is not as strong as you think, which means that when you put in money, you will not, in Chinese, we call Sila. You will not all in. You will manage your risk. You will put in a certain percentage of your portfolio and you wouldn't quote unquote whack. Right? So with, with Atta IMS, I don't think their numbers are actually as good as Dice, uh, sorry, uh, SKP. So it probably wouldn't have fall through these seven criteria or so. Okay, so that sums up the sharing for the night. 
Thank you, MJ, for Fire for the insightful sharing about finding multi beggar companies. So we'll be looking forward for your next sharing also. Now, for everyone else, if any of you are interested in our MQ Trader system, like our E Trade, our MQ Points, or our affiliate program, you can use all these systems for free by opening an account with our selected advertisers. So if you want to open one, you can type five in the chat box or scan the QR code on the screen to proceed. Okay, now we'll be starting our mysterious gift session. Remember that in this session, you can win gifts worth up to 249 ringgit. So the rules are quite simple. I will show questions and answer options on the screen and you just need to type out the correct answer. There will be a total three questions, and for each question, we will choose the first two person who answered correctly to be the winners. And if you have won before within this webinar, we will pass the chance to the next person so that everyone gets a fair chance of it. So for winners, remember that please send us your contact details through the Google form, which will be put in the chat box so that we can arrange to send the gifts to you. So if all of you are ready, I will start the mystery gift session now. All right, the first question is, how many criteria did MJ share today to find a multi-bagger company? I believe this is a very simple question. Is it A, three criteria, or is it B? Okay, the correct answer is B, seven criteria. So let me see who are the first two winners. Okay, the first two winners for the first question is Victor and Questra. Remember, congratulations, you won the gift and send us your contact details by using the Google link in the chat box. Okay, so for question two, which counter is mentioned in MJ's sharing? Okay, the correct answer is A, SKP resources. So the person that got it correct, let me check. Okay, the first two person that got it correct is Vixian Chu and Wildernet. Remember, send us your contact details in the Google form, then only we can arrange the gifts to you. Okay, so now we will move on to our last question for the night. What is the ratio that we can use to easily evaluate a business valuability? Is it gonna be A, current ratio, or B, asset turnover ratio? or even D, price to earning ratio. Yes, the correct answer is D, price to earning ratio. Congratulations, Lee C. Win and Brian LY95 for winning the last mystery gift questions. So remember, congratulations to all six winners. Send us your contact details via the Google form in the link. And remember, for all our MQ members, you can get a bonus of 300 MQ points as a check-in reward for tonight's webinar. All you have to do is screenshot any part of this webinar and then upload it in the quiz email that you will receive after the webinar ends. So if any of you still haven't taken a screenshot, you can take it right now. Once again, if any of you are interested in using our MQ Trader, in, if you want to use our MQ Trader systems for free, you can do so by opening a trading account with our selected advertisers, which is also free. Then if you do so, you can use our MQ E-Trade system. We also have MQ points where you can use it to redeem attractive rewards. And also we have MQ affiliate program. Now you can enjoy all these services for free if you join our MQ Trader member. 
then you can join it for free by opening a trading account with our selected advertisers. You can type five in the chat box if you want to continue and learn more. So once again, MQ Trader will be organizing webinars at least once every month and we'll be organizing giveaway campaigns from time to time as well. So remember to like and follow us on Facebook or Instagram so that you won't miss any of our future updates. Once again, a very big thank you to all of you who participated in our webinar today. So with each of your participation, all of you have certainly made it to a greater success. So once again, thank you all for staying through. I sincerely hope that all of you have learned something today. I will now turn off the camera, but still keep the webinar live for another few more minutes so that you can refer back to the links in the chat box, chat box before it's gone. So thank you for participating in our webinar. I'm Robin from MQ Trader. I wish you have a great week ahead. Thanks for watching.